So first of all, I just want to say thank you to Meredith and Kate and just acknowledge how thrilled I am that I'm soon to be able to call them and the incredible AI Now staff that put this event together, my colleagues in a couple of weeks. I'm very fortunate. For me, this panel is a really meaningful way to start my time at AI Now um, because it touches on two issues that have been a huge part of my work. I spent the first formative years of my career working on immigration, and I was just a few months into my time at the United Food and Commercial Workers Union when the Bush administration decided to conduct what at the time was some of the largest immigration raids our nation had ever seen, and they happened in our meatpacking plants. So what that meant for me was that I was able to see for myself how ICE's efforts disproportionately affected, and that is an understatement, our Latino union members, and how ICE treated members of my own community like animals. Later on, as a lawyer, I also got involved in criminal justice issues. I litigated a case against the California Board of Parole, and I served on a local um, bar association's criminal justice task force. But one thing that will always sit with me is that familiar sense of injustice and the pit I felt in my stomach when I sat in a criminal courtroom proceeding for the first time and watched one black or brown defendant after another being brought in in chains to be arraigned. It was the same visceral reaction I had during the ICE raids. And that's when I realized just how interconnected the immigration and criminal justice issues are. Communities of color have been bearing the unjust burden of discriminatory policies and biased decision makers basically since the birth of our nation. They've also broadly endured racial profiling, excessive force, and the killing of unarmed civilians, both at the hands of local police and immigration agents, especially at the border. Meanwhile, it's important to keep in mind during this panel that half of all federal arrests are immigration related, which effectively makes our federal criminal justice system a deportation pipeline. So this isn't just a panel about the use of AI by the police state, it's about how the government is injecting an unreliable technology that is often biased in and of itself into policing contexts that are completely riddled with discrimination and with zero guardrails. The only guardrails are the folks you're gonna see on stage tonight. So this panel also couldn't be more timely. I'm sure many of you saw the New York Times Magazine article that came out this morning um, detailing how ICE relies on big data and AI to track, hunt, and I quote, disappear Spanish-speaking families. So how AI technology can reflect and perpetuate the inequities and injustices in our society, in case you can't tell, is one of the topics I am most passionate about tackling at AI Now. And it is why I'm so glad I'm gonna get the chance to learn from the three bold and brilliant women that I'm about to introduce and hear more about how they're pushing back. Marisa Franco is the director and co-founder of Mi Gente. Ruha Benjamin is the associate professor of African American Studies at Princeton University. And Christian Lum is the lead statistician at the Human Rights Data Analysis Group. And should be out in just a second. It sounds like we're having some mic yeah, issues. Her, her mic. Um, stage. But I think we can get started with Ruha, and um, I think I'd just love for, ah, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'd love for each of you to discuss your work around the use of AI and uh, in policing and immigration, and explain for us why this is a problem that caught your attention in the first place. Ruha, should we start with you? Sure. So uh, what, what caught my attention a few years ago was the proliferation of headlines and hot takes about so-called racist robots and other forms of machine bias that framed problems of AI and automated discrimination as if it were mainly a problem of technology gone wrong rather than about uh, a society that's been wrong. So one of the things I set out to do along with a number of folks in this room is to broaden the frame of discussion, expanding the problem space from racist robots to racist societies and unjust structures that materialize in harmful technology. Because 
what we're fighting for, I think, is not only the power to shape our material and virtual world, but the ability to shape the intellectual and imaginative space to define what problems need addressing in the first place. The fact is we can't accept the problem space as defined by those who currently monopolize power and resources because then we're forced to maneuver on a terrain created by others, made to play by someone else's rules and forced to choose between faulty choices. For example, when it comes to carceral technologies like electronic shackles and GPS monitoring, if the powers that be present the option, we will either warehouse people in cages or track and surveil them using high-tech monitoring systems, if these are the only choices, many people will rightly insist that the freedom to move around outside of a cage is better and more, the more humane option, never mind the violent constraints, constraints and stigma that come with it. This is what I mean about defining the problem space to limit the available options and call it reform and betterment, which is why we have to always ask what alternatives are being left off the table? What really is the issue? Is it risky individuals who need monitoring or risk-producing institutions that create social disorder, precarity, and penalize those who are forced to navigate systems designed to entrap them. So the task, as I see it, is not only to critique and oppose carceral technologies, however important, but to seed new forms of social organization that eventually make our current punishment system superfluous. We have to hone our creative capacity to enact these alternatives as much as we sharpen our critical capacity to diagnose the harm and violence of our current reality. And the good news is that we can draw on a long tradition of abolitionist visionaries who refused to cede, C-E-D-E, the problem space. And I think what the task now is for all of us to figure out how we're going to build on this tradition. Thank you. Christiane, I'd love for you to tackle that question. I'd also would love to hear more about your research. And I took a look at some of the papers you authored and saw that you uncovered that black defendants were twice as likely and Hispanic defendants 1.5 as likely as white defendants to be made ineligible for supervised release, and that was based on an automated risk assessment tool. You also found that allowing a predictive policing algorithm to allocate police resources would result in disproportionate policing of low-income communities and communities of color, which would target black people at twice the rate of, white, of whites. I'd love to hear more. How have you examined the AI systems that are being used in criminal justice to retrieve data like this? And what are some of the most surprising things you've learned? And how does this sort of research reveal avenues for pushing back against the tech space? Right. Great, thank you, thank you for that question. Um, I guess I would start by saying that is an awfully hard act to follow, and I should also start by saying that I am a statistics nerd, so it's probably going to be a little bit less powerful coming from a statistics nerd, <laughs> <laughs> for coming from my statistics nerd self. Um, but yeah, so a big thrust of my past work has been revealing how predictive technology in criminal justice um, does have the potential to disparately impact um, communities of color. And these numbers that you, you've just said, that people could be up to two, black people could be up to two times as likely to be, to be the recipients, not recipients, probably not the right word, but the subject of targeted policing and 1.5 times as likely to be denied entry to what's, what is likely a um, beneficial program. These are the things that really catch people's attention. Um, and I totally understand why, right? You hear those numbers and it's, it's in a lot of ways horrifying to feel that like technology that's being deployed um, purportedly in the, in the public interest is maybe harming or is harming communities um, in that way. But when I really start to think back on my recent work, um, aside or in addition to revealing the very particular numbers and sort of revealing those figures, I think some important takeaways have been maybe a little bit more abstract or general. And I thought maybe I could go into a couple of those in, in, in terms of how my research sort of intersects with ways to push back. And so I think the first main takeaway I, I hope people take from my work is that data is not objective. And of course, many of us know that. I think many of us on this stage tonight are going to talk about that. I think 
we unfortunately are just right back there, so I didn't hear the whole um, opening thing, but I, I assume they also mentioned that. Um, but especially when we're talking about data that was created by the, the criminal justice system with its history of inequality, data encodes all kinds of very human decisions, like the decision to stop a person or the decision to arrest a person, or even the decision to report something to the police to try to get them to um, respond to it. On top of it, it encodes larger institutional policies, like where to patrol, wh whether certain areas should be over-policed, under-policed, what sorts of enforcements to, um, to prioritize relative to others. And it, and it encodes different sorts of laws that have had discriminatory impact, like drug laws that drew arbitrary distinctions between different classes of drugs um, that disproportionately penalized communities of color. And all of this gets baked into the data. And when a model is developed using this data, um, it learns those patterns to make those predictions and it can reproduce much of the inequality that we see today. And I think probably most disturbingly, based on those predictions, because they come off as objective, it can then be used to um, justify the continued weight of the criminal justice system against the communities that have um, most been subject to its abuse in the past. Um, and, and in that case, you know, sort of using that idea that the, the data itself is not objective, I think that is one sort of strong avenue to really push back. Um, but that sort of calls for like a wholesale rejection, right? Um, and I think there are other ways to push back as well. And I think this may be, I, and I, I want to say I totally agree with you on expanding the decision space. So maybe this sounds a little bit more moderate than what you're saying. But of course, the world is complicated. The world's nuanced. And I think there are other ways to push back that involve um, engaging directly with the technology, sort of acknowledging that the world is where it is today. Um, there are some things that are in use um, that, um, and we have to deal with sort of harm reduction in, in the environment that, that we um, are in today. And so one, one area that I've been working on lately that you mentioned just now is risk assessment. And for those of you that haven't been following this over the past several years, this has been a really hot um, topic issue. And so and it's particularly in, in the context of pretrial um, reform, these are models that are used to make predictions about whether a person is likely to fail to appear for their court dates if they're released or whether they're likely to be rearrested mm -hmm. if they're released. And then based on those predictions, um, a recommendation is made usually to a judge about whether the person should be released without conditions or maybe what conditions they should be released under or in extreme cases um, that maybe they shouldn't be released. And when I said the thing, the thing is really complex and nuanced and from where I've been sitting, it seems like um, you know, everything I said before, the data is encoding all these terrible things. We can't totally scrub those things from the data, right? And so it is embedding a lot of these problems. Um, but the other thing I'm seeing is that in a lot of legislation that's coming out, risk assessment is sort of buried into it, right? It's coming about, it's sort of the legislation that, the, of things we really like, things that get rid of bail, things that really decrease the number of people who can be detained at all. Um, included in that is some provision for risk assessment or some direct mandate for risk assessment. And so what my sort of working hypothesis is here in this case is that, you know, risk assessment is in some way greasing the rails to get through these really large legislative changes um, that benefit a lot of people because it's sort of making this maybe, um, this promise that, look, we are gonna start releasing a lot of people, we're gonna undo a lot of this harm by like, of bail, right? Um, but, but we have to sort of, maybe not we have to, but a concession is made that, that, that we're going to include this sort of tool. So in that case, I think it does make sense to engage directly with the tool and try to figure out ways to reduce, to reduce the harm of the tool. But I think we can't really do that if the tools are sort of held on a pedestal because they, um, you know, they're coming from a computer, essentially. And so, um, this sort of brings me to my second main takeaway, which is the importance of demystifying the models and how they're created. And I think what's important to understand is that all these models are really an instantiation of a policy. And when people hear a policy like, hey, we're gonna automatically release, there's gonna be no option to detain, say, anybody, or very little option to set bail for um, anybody who, say, is charged with a misdemeanor, people feel, feel empowered to argue with that. They might say something like, hey, that's, that's far, that still leaves far too many cases where you even have that option. I think we should expand that. I think it should be anybody who has been charged with a misdemeanor or any other number of crimes, right? Feel, people feel that they can argue with that. And when people hear something like, okay, um, anybody who has less than 10 points against them, those are the people who we can release. And those 10 points are coming from a computer model. I think feel, people feel less empowered um, to sort of argue with where those 10 points come from. But the thing is, well, one, even though those 10 points are sort of maybe inspired by a computer model, if you really knew how the sausage was made, you'd come to realize that these are things you really can argue with. So in a recent example I was looking at, um, it really did come down to, to, to really simplify a complicated issue or a complicated process, people sitting in a room deciding that if you were young, that counts against you four points instead of six. Um, 
And I think if people knew that, if people realized that these are very human decisions going into building these automated systems, they would feel empowered to push back against that. And even in other cases, even when it isn't just people sitting in a room, there are really consequential decisions that are being made about um, you know, how things are being counted against people in these cases. So for example, um, you know, should charges that have, should arrest for prior activity, for prior behavior that have now been decriminalized, should those count against you now? In some cases, those are still counted against you in the model. And I think people should feel empowered to be like, hey, this isn't right. But on top of all of this, and this is the most important piece where I think people can really push back, is that on top of the tech aspect, on top of the computer model, is a layer of policy. And I think what we're really seeing is bad policy even more so than bad tech in this case, because the policy is what gets us from, here's a prediction, now what are we gonna do about it, right? And so when we see a tool, say, recommending only maybe like 40% of people for release or 50% of people for release, that's a really easy one to argue with. That's really easy to say, look, that's policy. That's not science. And this policy is bad because we need more decarceration. Um, and so, Yes, I think there's sort of two avenues for pushing back. That's sort of my conclusion here. It's not as quite as powerful at the end here, but you know, I think there are two ways to, there are two ways to push back here. One, the sort of wholesale rejection, but two, to engage directly with the tools, um, sort of work on ways to make them less harmful and really feel empowered to, um, to critique and push for, for ways to make them better and fairer. So, We've learned from Christiane a bit about how the sausage is made and we've heard some of those jaw-dropping statistics. Marisa, we've also seen the immigration headlines, the one from this morning, also the ones we've all heard about, the children being separated from their parents, kids in cages, travel bans, a hate-fueled gunman targeting Mexicans in El Paso. Um, refugees being turned away at the border. The list goes on and on. And I know for you, these aren't just headlines. They are very much your reality. So could you tell us more about how AI and tech figure into the situations the communities you work with are confronting? Sure. Um, so I'll start with Mi Gente is a social justice and organizing hub for Latinx people here in the United States. So some of the work we do is base building. We talk about building a political home for, for Latinos and Latinas here in the United States. We use um, media and technology to tell our own story on our own terms. And most importantly, um, we are a building a fighting machine to address the issues of our time. And clearly one of the issues for, uh, one of the most pressing issues for Latinx people in the United States today is immigration. Um, so we come out of, you know, we used to, a lot of us, the folks that started Mi Gente were part of a campaign called Not One More. And that campaign was working on individual cases of deportation. We were advocating for action at the federal level to stop deportations. And we were running campaigns at the local level to try to address uh, policies that would impact immigrant communities. And one of the most important things about that work is that, you know, you have to watch the patterns. Mm -hmm. And someone like me, you see me here, you buy, if you see some pictures of me somewhere, you're gonna see I'm probably not this cleaned up, I'm in the street, you're doing the bullhorn thing. <laughs> and I would be considered maybe extreme by immigration and customs enforcement. But the fact of the matter is that the only extreme, the, the, the extreme, the institution with the extreme views is actually ICE, because ICE's stated mission is to deport all undocumented people from this country, all 11 million. Those that work with you, that are part of your family, that love you or you love them, you go to school with them, you're in a community with them. And that is their objective. They have a problem. Their problem is they have probably less than 10,000 agents. And so the fight over the last several years has been how are, they have a logistical problem. And so where it started was, we only have 10,000, let's start working with local police. There's a hell of a lot of police in this country. So let's start using them. Let's have government agencies share data. Data they don't got no business sharing, but let's share it because government agencies should be talking to each other, right? Um, and so for many years in the immigrant rights movement, the fight was what is the dividing line between police and ICE? Anybody you know that's an activist has been working to stop deportations 
probably has heard about programs like Secure Communities, 287G, these are very, you know, not very good names, they've kind of tried to improve it over the years, but all of these programs were essentially trying to deal with the logistical hurdle. And what used to be, well, how'd you get caught up? Oh, well, I, you know, a raid, you started talking about workplace raids, talking about parts of Iowa. Some people then, you know, you get arrested. Well, where do immigrant, most immigrant communities are in working class communities or people of color communities that are over-policed. So you're gonna most likely get caught up in the, in the criminal justice system. But what started happening later was, well, what happened? How'd you get caught up? I don't know, I was Netflix and chilling. <laughs> I don't know, I just paid my taxes. I, so what started happening, so we started to have to ask the question, where is this coming from? Where is this coming from? And today we have a story in the New York Times of a woman, Gladys, in the state of Washington, sent a Facebook message to someone who wanted to buy a piñata. She sends a Facebook message to sell this piñata. She's a mother of three. She goes to meet the person. She would have made $20 making that sale, and instead she, she encountered ICE agents. She was taken, disappeared, and deported within three weeks. And, and that is the danger of the, the wholesale introduction into technology companies and data companies, and that is why we started you know, really researching and trying to understand this problem, and what led us to really build up the No Tech for Ice campaign and the campaign to really target uh, Palantir. I'm going to turn it back to you for a moment. So one of the big topics in criminal justice circles right now is the need for racial reckoning. Mm -hmm. And on that topic, Brian Stevenson had said that you can't disconnect the death penalty from the legacy of lynchings, and you can't disconnect the legacy of lynching from the legacy of enslavement. Mm -hmm. Is there a connection between these legacies and the legacy that AI is leaving behind in the criminal justice system? And if so, how do we stop that vicious cycle? Yes and yes. So there's always a connection between past and present. Um, but there are at least two features of racist systems that make it hard to detect these connections. One, racism is an amnesia-inducing technology. It's designed to make us forget. Likewise, if modern racism has an aesthetic, I would call it minimalist chic because it allows us, it allows for more and more racist violence to be less and less discernible, operating under our noses. So now enter AI systems that facilitate this racial minimalism, allowing it to penetrate every facet of social life, lethally undetected, under the guise of progress, innovation, upgrade. Rather than a racist judge, prosecutor, policeman, border patrol officer to which we can point, we have predictive analytics that create proxies for race, calculating the extent to which someone's life has been structured by racial domination without ever asking an individual's race. Algorithmic alibis facilitating this racial denial. So one of the fundamental design principles of AI and racism alike is that both are in the business of predicting the riskiness of individuals and groups, high-risk parolees, at-risk students, high-risk patients, rather than focusing on the institutions that produce risk in the first place. So if we go back to Brian Stevenson's provocation, AI in the carceral system is akin to drapetomania. How many of you have heard this term before, drapetomania? So it was coined by famed um, physician Dr. Samuel Cartwright in 1851 to describe a curious mental condition causing the enslaved to run away. <laughs> What's more, drapetomania had a predictive component insofar as Cartwright shrewdly surmised when the enslaved are mistreated or beaten too severely, that makes the condition appear <laughs> and they want to run away. In leading medical journals, so despite the fact that fleeing is a rational, incisive response to an unjust system, rather than diagnose the institution of slavery as sick, science is used in this case to pathologize people trying to survive it. 
Like our modern day predictions, those invested with the power of prediction would rather diagnose the riskiness of individuals, calculating their likelihood to commit a crime, return to trial, recidivate, rather than focus on the underlying injustices at work. But this is the algorithmic slate of hand. Carceral technologies actually don't predict crime. They produce them by encoding historical patterns of racist policing and criminalization into supposedly race-neutral code. So we can think of AI as a kind of digital drapetomania. So if there's one takeaway from uh, Kate and Meredith's presentation, it's that there's no easy technical fix for human bias in AI. So knowing that, what is your vision of change when it comes to the use of AI by the police state? And Marisa, I'm going to start with you. So I just want to quickly pick up on Gladys. <laughs> um, so part of how did they, how did they know to go there? And so what happened in that case is you had agents just parked around neighborhoods where they're mostly immigrant communities, punching in folks' license plate numbers, creating essentially investigating people. And so Palantir is a company that, you know, my shorthand, non-technologist way of saying is like they build Facebook for policing. And this company has 29 active contracts with the federal government totaling to about 1.5 billion. So we've been running a campaign to target Palantir, really as to make an example and to really shine a light on a very large and expansive, increasingly growing system. A system that, where we are seeing high-tech policing, low-tech democracy. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are facing an all-seeing state that is veiled in secrecy. And so part of our advocacy is to get Palantir to cut this contract so that ICE is not able to have a 650% increase of their workplace raids in this country. But we're also trying to spark a wider conversation about what might this look, what is happening in your neighborhood? What's happening in your city? What kind of contracts are being initiated by your local or state governments with these types of technology or data companies? Um, and so we've been running this No Tech for Ice campaign, have been targeting, campaign, targeting the company, and most recently in terms of a vision. Um, we're living in a time that's, you know, it's very difficult to win something positive at the federal level. I don't think I need to explain why. <laughs> but there is a, the, the old adage is don't mourn, organize. Mm. And that is what we have done. And by targeting companies like Palantir, which essentially represent the enablers of the Trump agenda. And in a time where, where it seems like all roads are blocked, we have to do what people who organize um, have always done, is find a way where there is no way. And it's beautiful to see alliances between community members, immigrant communities, communities of color, with workers, tech workers, service workers, warehouse workers, um, in students. And so one of the latest phases of the campaign that we've moved is a, uh, a tactic really um, in bringing students in. So we have over 2,000 students who have pledged not to work for Palantir. Essentially tech workers saying, we will not build it. <laughs> and these students are on almost 30 campuses uh, across the country. And so for us, that's, that's what we see as a vision to be able to continue, to, we have to both shine a light, but we have to organize and we have to pressure these companies to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Christiane, so from where you sit, you've seen how these algorithms work. Mm -hmm. What's your vision for change? So I think, what did you say a second ago? They don't, they don't predict future crime, they predict? Produce it. They produce it. Yeah, you know, what, what we often say in our sort of pithy thing, because you said that reminded me of this, is they don't predict future crime, they predict future policing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and I think Absolutely. it's something similar. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think one of the things that I think we have, when, if we want to use AI in this space, where we, we do, there is a lot of data, right? And I think these sorts of institutions keep really good records about themselves. And so I think if we're going to be using it in the future, my vision would be to sort of turn it back on itself, right? To sort of get back to those, to use the AI to get back to the institutional policies that are causing these problems, to, to ferret out police officers who are very likely to have complaints of force, use of force complaints against them. 
um, to sort of reveal the sorts of patterns um, that we see in, in the data, like um, that the use of pretrial detention actually compels guilty pleas that wouldn't have otherwise happened. So use the criminal justice data, because they're keeping great records about themselves, right? Maybe not great. Maybe the data's not in a great format. I don't need to go down that road. <laughs> um, sorry, <laughs> captive audience here. Let me tell you about all the problems I've had data munging. Gosh. Um, That's a whole other panel. Really? Really? Because <laughs> we've got 51. No, just kidding. Uh, I'm not going to do that to you guys. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, so, turn, so, so taking the data that exists and turning it back on itself and sort of changing the questions we're asking and, and what we're asking the AI sort of technology to do and answer for us. Mm -hmm. well, you got this off to such a... You got this off to such an eloquent start. Why don't you close it out for us and tell us about what you see as the path forward? Sure, so laws, yes, litigation, yes, organizing, yes, education, yes. So as an educator, that's my ground zero, that's the sandbox that I play in. So for all the students listening, I would encourage you not to wait uh, until you've entered the real world to start making demands and organizing, um, and also practicing what we're preaching. So the world is here and now, so don't wait. I'm a student of Octavia E. Butler, who taught us that there, um, there's nothing new under the sun, but there are new suns. Mm. We have to carve out mental and emotional space to not only react and critique, but reimagine and create. Practically speaking, for me, that means staying connected to the life-affirming work happening in our communities, um, which we've already heard about, which we'll hear more about. And in the words of Baldwin, I can't be a pessimist because I'm alive. To be a pessimist means that you have agreed that human life is an academic matter. Thank you. What a wonderful way to close out. Thank you, Ruha. Thank you, Ruha. Thank you, Marisa. And